Hello sunshines and welcome to my youtube channel welcome to set apart diaries if you're new here consider subscribing to this channel so in today's video guys i wanted to share with you my reaction or kind of my commentary on a wonderful must i say a wonderful debate that george farmer who is a catholic had with ali stuckey who is a protestant she's a southern baptist what so. is your biggest hang up with the catholic church if you had to name just one to start off with and I'm, I'm sure there's many yes i'm sure there's more than yeah. one it's such a wonderful debate you know contrasting catholicism versus protestantism i always have that hard time saying that word but anyway i thought it was a wonderful debate it aired on candace owens show so george farmer is the husband of candace owens every time i've listened to candace you know who's a conservative kind of political commentator um who has a pretty large platform i think everybody knows about candace anytime i've heard her speak about her faith she always has this hesitation i think candace is still figuring those things out and she herself says that i get so many questions from you guys back at home about where i'm at uh, when it comes to my personal faith journey and it's been a tricky one since getting married i you will hear me say this in this discussion between ali stuckey and my husband but i do very much believe that the mentally the household when it comes to faith my husband was raised catholic i was ra raised Protestant. And of course, we have a lot of discussions surrounding faith. I am attending Catholic church services more and more, obviously, because I bring my children uh, for celebrations at the cathedral and where my husband attends church. And the discussions have gotten interesting because my husband planted a seed in my head that won't go away. And I would not yet describe me as being in a place where that seed has fully bloomed. But it is a question that I am struggling with as somebody with Protestant beliefs. And what he essentially said to me, he was also uh, formerly Protestant and now he's a Catholic, was do I believe that in the 1500 years following Jesus Christ, leading up to Martin Luther stapling his theses, that nobody went to heaven. So essentially, uh, Jesus saved us, and then for about 1,500 years, nobody went to heaven until Martin Luther stapled his theses and corrected things. I don't believe that. I struggle with that question, and it has been something that I have been sitting with for a very long time, of course, because that would almost imply in my mind that Martin Luther is the Savior and not Jesus. And so as I've struggled with that, it hasn't been this come to moment of, well, the Catholic faith has gotten everything right because I still have a lot of questions. I've heard George Farmer speak before um, on Matt's show, this Catholic Pints with Aquinas show. Um, and he's a very intelligent guy as well. But um, I absolutely love Ali Stuckey. She is such a, an example of a woman who is smart, articulate, persuasive, knows doctrine and theology, um, is a Christian, believes in submission, and she just is such a gift to the Christian community, I believe. You know, she has this podcast called Relatable, and I, I don't know, I, I'm such a fangirl. I'm totally a fangirl because I think she does so much good. One of the things I absolutely love about Ellie Stuckey is that she always brings back to the gospel. She always brings it back to Jesus. You know, she always brings back to truth. You know, she doesn't just leave it at politics. She always ties it back to Christianity. And I have such respect for that because I truly believe that, especially when you talk about politics and, you know, things like abortion, all of these things that are of human value, how can you actually, t being a Christian, not talk about the gospel? You know, it's, I don't understand that, you know, and she's one of those few concerns conservatives that is Christian first and then conservative and not the other way around. So I have major respect for her. So in today's video, guys, I just want to share parts of the clip from the debate. And if you want to watch the whole debate for yourself, I'm going to link it down below in my description box. So the first thing that they kind of started the debate with, you know, Ali talks about how she knows so many Catholics, you know, that for them, you know, Catholicism is much of a cultural thing versus a true faith and that she knows a lot of Catholics who, you know, don't necessarily know the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't know really the, the fundamentals almost of Christianity. They just know it as a cultural thing, like either they attended Catholic school or they attended mass, but they don't really know the gospel, you know? Just because of where I live, or maybe this is true in general, I haven't seen the statistics on it. It is more usual that someone is raised in a Catholic church and they become a Protestant. 
Now, the reason for that is because very often they don't have stories like you did where they actually were caused to question their theology and search things out in the scriptures and then try to come up with those satisfactory answers. I think this is true. This is also true of a lot of evangelicals too. So this is not necessarily a Protestant versus Catholic thing. But I have noticed that because Catholicism is typically so cultural, it's even embedded with people's nationality a lot of times. If they come from Mexico, they come from South America, they come from Italy, it is a part of the familial culture. And so very often they don't actually know Catholic theology or why they're a Catholic. Maybe they go to mass or you know, they've gone through all of the steps to be a good Catholic. But then I have a family member that's like this, an in-law who she went to college and she heard the gospel for the first time. And she had grown up in the Catholic church this is a very common story. She didn't even really know what the Bible said. It reminds me, I had a friend in college she was Catholic and she was like, well, I got to go to mass. And I said something about John three sixteen, which is arguably the most famous Bible verse. And she didn't even know what I was talking about. She didn't even know that I was talking about a Bible reference. And this is something that is so true because I specifically had a, an encounter. I think that God just really used me in this person's life to share with them the gospel, but told me that he was in Catholic school, went to mass, you know, and all these things, but he really did not know the gospel. He really didn't know much about Jesus. He hadn't really read the Bible and it amazed me. I was like, so what were you taught? And oftentimes, you know, people who grew up in Catholicism or going to Catholic schools, they leave the faith because they don't like the Pope, they don't like the Catholic Church. And a lot of times when people get serious about faith, they really actually read the Bible, you know, oftentimes they become Protestant. And that's kind of like, you know, and but just so what's interesting is that with Candace's husband, George, it was the opposite, you know, he kind of grew up more in the, in the Protestant kind of faith and then he converted to catholicism very interesting so basically alice shares her opposition where she really disagrees with the catholic church which is the infallibility of the pope and this is a big one because i think this is a very interesting point that she makes because in an evangelical protestant faith you know the ultimate authority is not the pope it's not a man of any kind is the scripture, sola scriptura, one, one of the five solas from, from the Reformation. I'm going to assume that you and I probably have some of the same hangups about the Catholic Church. I think some of them for me have been assuaged via conversation with George, but there are a few that definitely haven't. So I'll ask you the question, Ali, what is your biggest hang up with the Catholic Church? If you had to name just one to start off with. And I'm, I'm sure there's many. Yes. I'm sure there's more than yeah. one, but let's, let's get to. <sighs> yes, okay. I mean, I would probably, I, I'd probably say the biggest one is the Pope and the authority of the Pope. And I know this is even a debate within Catholicism, but the infallibility of the Pope, who the Pope is, of course, the argument is that the Pope goes all the way back to Peter, which I don't believe. Um, and so, and really just the structure and the authority of the Catholic Church really one of the causes of the Reformation was this sola scriptura idea that the final authority is scripture, that church itself cannot come up with the doctrines. It can't come up with the practice of indulgences and, says that the, and say that this has divine authority, that everything a church leader says, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a priest, whether it's a pope, has to conform to what the Holy Spirit has already said through scripture. So four conditions of papal infallibility. So when the Pope intends to teach by virtue of his supreme authority on the matter of faith and morals to the church, he is preserved by the Holy Spirit from error. His teaching act is therefore called infallible and the teaching which he articulates is termed irreformable. So basically whatever the Pope says, goes and it's the supreme authority versus protestants who believe that no man's words no priest you know pastor's words are supreme or ultimate ultimately everything rests on what the word of god says even though yes we are in the body of christ we do have pastors and church leaders that we ought to obey and you know whose instruction we should respect and everything but if we see a leader straying from the word of god we must call him out on it. 
this is how we differ from the Catholics. So it's interesting that this whole idea of the Pope came from Peter when Jesus said to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcoming. I will give you the keys of kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. The Catholics will consider this whole structure of the Pope that comes stems from Peter. But I always find that so interesting because remember when in Antioch, Apostle Paul calls Peter out and he says, you know, you know, because Peter would not dine with the Gentiles, even though he was dining when the Jews came, you know, he refused because he was afraid of the Jews and what would the Jews would think when he they would see him dining or eating with the Gentiles. And Paul basically calls him out on that because he says, you're not adhering to the teachings of the gospel because in Jesus Christ, you're made a new creation. There's no such things as Jew or Gentile or circumcised or un uncircumcised, you know, and Paul called him out. And so Peter, who so-called, you know, is the rock of the church, was in the wrong and Paul called him out him because, you know, essentially a man, no matter what position he has, does not hold the ultimate authority. Scripture does. Sola Scriptura. Popes, you know, been wrong many times. I mean, half of why there have been so many, you know, horrible things done in the name of Christianity is because of these popes who were corrupt who are wrong, but because the church gave them so much authority, their word was the ultimate authority. You know, it was, it was it overshadowed the word of God. And this is what the Reformation brought. So I think that's a, a very interesting point. And I'm glad that um, Ali, you know, and I feel like, I you know, George didn't have a really good rebuttal. I mean, he said in the Bible, he's like, where in the Bible do you find that solo scriptura? And you can deduce. And here's the thing. So, Sola Scriptura, where in the Bible does it say Sola Scriptura? Yes, well, the doctrine of Sola Scriptura, if you go back to why the Reformation happened, if you go back to Martin Luther's 95 Theses, which he didn't actually intend to spark some kind of revolution, that's why he wrote them in Latin, because he wanted them to be this academic debate and discussion among the professors at the University of Wittenberg. And it ended up kind of blowing up and starting this Reformation revolution in which he didn't, I don't think that he would have said necessarily sola scriptura, but his gripe was with, and I, it might seem like a roundabout way, but I am getting there. His gripe was with not just papal authority, but also the practice of indulgences, which is in very like crude terms, the idea that basically you can pay your way into heaven or you can pay souls out of purgatory. And well, basically... That, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on. I, I, I want to I hear your Yeah, well, I mean, rebuttal, just to come but... back on the question, because I just want to be clear. Scripture itself does not say scripture yes. alone, right? That's the point. It does not say at any point in scripture that scripture alone is to be utilized as the sole basis for faith. Yes, right? but I'm saying that that's not, the, that's not the establishment or that's not the contention of the reformers. I don't think the contention of the reformers, because I understand you believe that it's a circular argument, is necessarily in the same way that the Trinity isn't, exactly. that we don't see Trinity, exactly. but we both believe in the Trinity. And so we understand right. that you can deduce through scripture that, okay, this is the word of God. And as the word of God, which we understand, there is final authority here. And so, I think we agree on that. What I don't agree is that there is power conferred to the Pope or to the priest that we simply do not see well, with I'm biblical support. But I thought, you know, you know, him saying like, where do you see Sola Scriptura? We clearly have Bible verses, you know, that say that we should not add or remove anything from the word of God. One of the things that the Pharisees were so bad about, you know, and Jesus called them out on it was that they would add to the law. They would add their own rules to the law, you know, constantly and burdening people with their man-made additions to the law of God, you know? And, and in the same way, I feel like that's what the Catholic Church does. It's like there's the gospel of Jesus Christ and they just add, they've added so many things that are so outside of scripture, like this whole idea of being of a pope of the structure, you know? Like, or the indulgences that, you know, Martin Luther was so against, you know, initially with the Reformation, you know, they added a lot of things to the gospel, you know, that are not found in scripture. And this is also, you know, one of the reasons why I 
tend to disagree with Catholicism, period. If you want to verse on, you know, this whole idea of not adding things, you know, there's like, you know, this applies to the law, but, you know, as a principle, it applies even in the New Testament. It says in De- Deuteronomy 4, 2, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. So clearly, you know, God says that my words, my word, don't add to it, don't remove from it. And oftentimes that's what I find in Catholicism is that they add to the things that are not even found in the Gospels, you know, in the eyewitness accounts of the Gospels or even the Paul's letters. This is a difference between Catholic and the Protestant faith, I think, is that a priest or a church leader within the Catholic Church does have some independent authority. The councils have some independent authority, whereas Protestants don't believe that we do. A pastor, a priest, a council, a meeting does not have any authority to come up with doctrine. It has to agree with scripture. And of course, there are going to be differences in interpretations, just like, I mean, federalism means that there's going to be, you know, differences within states of how we interpret the Constitution, how we apply the law and things like that. I think liberty is better than unity around what I would call what I would call false doctrine, which is what I think Catholicism is. So I don't think the disagreements are bad or speak to like the, uh, uh, I don't know, the heresy of soul scripture or or however you want to describe that, if that makes sense. So overall, you know, how do I feel about Catholics? You know, just like with Protestants in in our different denominations, I think, you know, essentially it boils down to the gospel. You know, do you believe that Jesus Christ, that he was 100% man and 100% God? Do you believe in the Trinity? These are the things that I think are um, foundational to the Christian faith. You know, obviously there's variations in terms of certain things that certain denominations believe in or emphasize more on. You know, can there be a true Catholic who doesn't agree with this whole idea of the Pope and they actually know scripture and are led by the Spirit of God, but they just have the label of a Catholic? I can very much agree. There can be, you know, and can there be Protestants or like Baptists and so on who, you know, grew up in, you know, in the, in the church and so on, but they have, you know, don't have sound doctrine or for instance, like progressive Christians. I don't think progressive Christians are Christians at all, even though, you know, they're not Catholics and many of them claim to be Protestants. I believe they're in a wrong because they've, they've departed things like gay marriage, abortion, you know, all of these things that are sins. You Remember know? that conversation that Jesus had with Samaritan woman where, you know, she says, you know, well, our fathers, you know, worshiped God on this mountain and, and Jesus is what Jesus replies to her. And I think this is essentially what I believe, you know, is the truth, no matter what your denomination is. Time is coming and has now come that the true worshipers will f- worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such as these to worship him. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in, tr- in spirit and in truth. So essentially the worshipers of Christ are those who worship him in the spirit and in truth, in the truth of his word and the authority of his word and what kind of spirit spirit of christ you know if you came to believe in jesus and the holy spirit dwells in you because here's the thing many people read the bible and they completely misinterpret like we literally have drag queens reading the bible these days you know and they find a way to totally twist you know things for their own benefit so obviously you know people who just read the bible you know you need to be worshiping the truth of the bible and according to the spirit of christ right so i think that's essentially what i believe in um would i ever want to be a catholic no way and i also love how you know they bring out this idea of individualism versus the centrality of the church you know that essentially protestants believe that each individual should be in the word of god despite their pastor despite what not they should know scripture intimately and per- personally and the catholic church has the very opposite where they put too much emphasis on the authority of the pope and the centrality of the church versus empowering their members to truly go into scripture into scriptures for themselves you know and not trust everything that the pope says you know this is the model that jesus had you know jesus was all about you knowing him personally you know that jesus came and curtain was torn and the old covenant you know the whole thing with the with the priests and and the sacrifice all that was 
was taken away. And now we come to Jesus through a personal relationship. And I feel like sometimes the Catholic Church still has this weird old model of, with the Pope of like priest and how you need to have this whole attachment to the Roman Catholic Church, you know? So I really enjoyed this um, debate between George Farmer and Ali Stuckey. I personally think that Ali won this debate. I think her points were far stronger than George's. I feel like George's like kind of like sounds really smart, but I feel like he kind of, I don't know. I I don't feel like he prepared really robust uh, rebuttals, you know, but I, but then again, I might be biased because, you know, I'm a Protestant, <laughs> you know, essentially I think what truly matters is how we interpret the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ and who he said he was. So, um, but that's kind of my belief anyway. All right, guys. So this was an enjoyable conversation. Subscribe to my channel and I'll see you guys in the next video.